Carpenter. I'm the founder of Desert Blockchain. And we have these monthly sessions on the fourth Wednesday of the month at 7 p.m. Arizona time. I'm delighted that everybody's joining us tonight. And we have various topics next month that will be on uh, non-fungible tokens, NFTs, and their use cases, and basically uh, dynamic property rights. So, but this evening, we're going to be talking about DeFi and regulation, and we have a stellar legal panel uh, that's assembled to talk about what's um, some of the dimensions of attempting to regulate some of these decentralized constructs. And we want to make sure that everybody understands that, you know, this is not advice that we're going to be talking about. Uh, the, the entire space is rapidly emerging. And I don't think that you can um, say that there's much of anything that's really uh, well-defined in this space. So uh, this, is, this is more like a, an exploration and a conversation with some folks that have really done some innovative uh, work in the regulatory realm. So I've prepared this little presentation to sort of set up our session and I'll just kind of uh, click through it. But basically the question on the table, uh, well, one of the first things to address is what is DeFi? You know, the definitions are still emerging. It's a very blanket term. Uh, it stands for decentralized finance. It somewhat bleeds into FinTech or financial technology. And again, tonight is just a discussion. It's, there's no definitive advice here and we welcome your comments. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can type your questions uh, into the chat session. So some of the topics we could explore and we're not uh, confined to this is just sort of to get people thinking is how's DeFi different from FinTech? You know, how is DeFi different from legacy finance? What are non-fungible tokens, NFTs, which have become all the rage within the last month or two, and or at least seemingly all the rage. Um, this is kind of part of the dilemma that we're dealing with is we really don't know how these markets are operating and what might be going on sort of behind the curtain in the NFTs. And then uh, how does DeFi fit within the traditional regulatory framework? What are the regulatory challenges associated with DeFi? And what could be created, if anything, to add consumer safeguards with DeFi? Now, I prefer the term consumer safeguards versus pr consumer protections. And, um, you know, we could certainly talk about that uh, as the session progresses. And then we have assembled uh, two folks that have done innovative work in the sandbox arena. And we'll be talking about um, how regulatory realms and, and jurisdictions can have and can create sandboxes and could they be created for, for DeFi basically. Then we'll open the discussion for questions and maybe explore if there's any next steps out of this. So with that, um, I, I'll just post the question, what is DeFi? Well, here is a definition out of Wikipedia. So it's associated with blockchain and some of the prominent blockchain uh, constructs that are out there like Ethereum. And uh, it involves smart contracts. Uh, we do have on the Zoom session, uh, Jason Horton, who's the, the uh, technical architect for Nori, which is a carbon removal trading platform. And I know that um, Jason has quite a bit of experience with Ethereum and I would consider him to be an expert in the realm of Ethereum technology. So if we do have some technical questions, we can certainly pose them to Jason. And Jason is the co-organizer of Desert Blockchain, by the way. So they threw out some numbers here towards the bottom. I think these numbers are probably uh, much larger now. Uh, as of January 2021, approximately 20, 20, uh, 0.5 billion invested in DeFi. 
And I suspect that number is much larger now. So uh, I'm going to go into kind of a, a brief introduction of the folks that are on the session. We have Paul Watkins from Washington, D.C. And Paul is now in private practice uh, with a, a rather um, impressive group of folks in D.C. in this area. And Paul was has been active with the uh, Consumer Pro Financial Protection uh, Bureau and was in charge of their innovation network and um, has worked in, not only, I would say, in North America, but I believe around the world in um, advising various entities on how they can set up sandboxes. And then Paul basically was the uh, architect of the Arizona FinTech sandbox and um, actually was with us on a desert blockchain session towards the beginning of that process um, some years ago. And uh, so this is kind of like uh, taking it to the next level. And uh, we're delighted to have you with us, Paul. So, and then it so happens that uh, Grant Frazier is with us and Grant uh, worked with Paul at the Arizona Attorney General's office to create the Arizona FinTech Sandbox and uh, basically is also, and also has written a, uh, an extensive paper on uh, sandbox considerations for regulatory uh, agencies. And Grant was a student of our third uh, expert, which who is uh, Professor Gary Marchant of the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. And uh, Professor Marchant has done a lot of work in how uh, law, science, and technology are coming together or can come together. A lot of great uh, work in soft law and um, Professor Marchand just mentioned that he's uh, published a paper on uh, blockchain regulation along with some other folks. And I would love to uh, get a link to that, Gary, and, and basically so we can include it in our next weekly update. So those are our uh, panelists for tonight. Uh, now we can go into questions and discussions. Before we do, I will uh, step through this presentation a little bit further just to show you some of the material that's included. This is an article that was recently published by Paul Watkins and uh, Jonah Crane on uh, consumer data and bipartisan plan to boost financial in innovation. Also, uh, Grant Frazier uh, with Nicholas Walter published this uh, extensive paper on regulatory sandboxes and how federal agencies can take part in cooperative federalism and uh, catalyze innovation and economic growth. And this is a uh, paper by Professor Marchant, Governance of Emerging Technology as a Wicked Problem. So that's um, some of the academic research that's present here this evening. I would also like to mention that uh, the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law um, hosts a, an annual conference, the Governance of Emerging Technology and Science. And this year it will be in October. And I highly, highly recommend you attend this. It's, it's basically a gathering of uh, several hundred of the, the top experts uh, in the world that get together and have some great presentations and talks and share ideas. And it's just, uh, I've attended it several years now and it's just a phenomenal event. So with that, I'm gonna stop the screen sharing and um, basically, make, yeah. so um, let's start off with you, Paul, and, and um, please fill in whatever parts of your introduction, your background that I might have uh, missed or glossed over and just kind of give us a, a, a view of um, what, you, what you think the current landscape is. But before you do that, I'll just open it up. Are there any questions, any comments before we just kind of um, step through some of the panelists here? 
Okay, cool. So, Paul, please uh, chime in and let's please uh, share with us what your take is at this point. Right. Well, thanks so much, Jay. It's wonderful to be with you and Grant and uh, and Gary. And it's great to be back with Desert Blockchain. As you mentioned, uh, this mm -hmm. was the first time I ever spoke about the FinTech Sandbox was at Desert Blockchain, I think, about three and a half years ago. I still think that's probably the toughest talk I've ever given uh, because the way you used to run that is you put the speaker in the middle and you kind of got this half bowl around you and then there are questions coming from every side and uh, of course we just drafted the law and I don't know if I, I think uh, Representative Winninger um, had had just released the text and uh, uh, but it was it was uh, somewhat new to me and it went through a couple iterations after that point, and I think in part because of because of the questions. So it's very kind of you to give me a lot of credit for that, but I wanna make sure uh, to emphasize uh, how much courage the Attorney General Mark Burnovich had uh, to put himself behind that legislation and be the first Attorney General to push that through. And of course, the banking commissioner, uh, current banking commissioner, Evan Daniels, played an absolutely crucial role, um, as well as uh, Representative Winnegar and, and a number of other a number of other folks. Um, so it's great to be back here talking about DeFi. You said it's seven o'clock for you it is, but for me it's 10. Uh, but I didn't want to be like these uh, East Coast biased people who uh, stop watching uh, Pac-12 football. So uh, I'm here and engaged uh, because uh, I know a lot's uh, going on uh, back, back in Arizona. So what uh, I, DeFi is presenting a lot of really interesting regulatory questions because the regulatory apparatus was really built around um, the interme intermediaries. And of course, the D in decentralized is to remove those to a large extent. And so the regulators have this uh, sort of key question, which is, do we say, well, there's the intermediary is not really there anymore, so I guess I guess there's nothing for us to do, or do they say, well, these rules that we've applied to intermediaries now we're going to apply them to everybody, uh, and in some respects, if you look at the Financial Action Task Force (FATF), um, the guidance that they just came out, in some respects, it looks like they're moving towards saying, at least with respect to money laundering and and and. Uh, regulations and know your customer and so forth, maybe we're going to see how expansively we can apply these. I'm not sure the U.S. statutes are set up for that. Um, so I think there are a whole host of very interesting regulatory questions that will get worked out through rulemaking uh, and in the courts. And I think this is really a key time for the community to engage and I've, I've been in government so long, I, I haven't for a long time been able to tell people that they should engage politically. Uh, you just can't do that when you're working for an agency. Um, but I can tell you the incumbents are engaged. The incumbents are very engaged in the political process. Uh, and I think there, there are uh, some good narratives uh, to tell. You know, overall cryptocurrency, the, uh, the percentage of funds that are being used for illicit purposes is declining even though the volume is increasing. So according to chain analysis, 20 billion illicit activity in 2019 down to uh, 10 billion in 2020. Uh, it's becoming a fairly uh, small percentage. And yet when you see people up for confirmation, the first thing they're talking about is illicit activity, uh, not necessarily the trend. So I think the community has a lot of work to do and will need to be engaged um, and, and participating in, in all the ways that, that people are allowed to do that. So look forward to the rest of the conversation. Great. Thank you, Paul. Grant, is there anything you would like to add to uh, what Paul just mentioned and maybe tell us a little bit about a, a summary of the paper that you recently published? Certainly. Yeah. Well, I don't think I can say what Paul said any better than he just did. So I'll leave it at that. But in terms of what, um, in terms of what the paper that I authored, what it talks about is, you know, in a regulatory sandbox and it talks primarily about Arizona's because at the time that I wrote it, Arizona's, I think was actually the only one in existence. Now there's a few more States, Utah and Wyoming that have them. Um, but it, it talks about this situation where even if, you have a state regulatory sandbox that peels back 
some layers of state regulation. If you have duplicative or potentially duplicative uh, federal regulations that still apply because of this, the supremacy clause and you're not really getting, um, and, and the state sandbox cannot pull back the federal regulations, then unless you have coordination in between the federal agency that could enforce certain regulations and a state agency, then you're not really getting the true full benefit that a state sandbox could, um, could provide to participants. And so it was encouraging the federal agencies. Um, there was a few that, that were listed in the article, five or six of them that have exemptive authority in their, uh, as part of you know the bailiwick of their power, they have exemptive authority to exempt certain um, parties from certain federal regulations. That exemptive authority, at least in my review, has not been exercised all that much in part because regulators like to regulate um, and they like to enforce their regulations. And usually the trend of government, especially the federal government at, and at the administrative agency level has usually been a trend towards increasing um, power and uh, an increasing number of, of regulations. So it was a call to exercise that exemptive authority in the event that there are federal regulations that overlap with the state regulations that are otherwise um, peeled back, so to speak, for the duration of the sandbox to really open up um, the, the positive uh, economic benefits of, of the state level sandboxes. Um, so, you know, it's, it's probably dependent upon, um, you know, well, it is dependent upon who's staffing those federal agencies, who's leading the federal agencies and in part, I think that's you know dependent upon who's uh, which presidential administration is in power and their their view on uh, deregulation at the federal level and putting more power in the, the hands of uh, state regulatory uh, bodies. So um, that that's a broad overview of the article. I think depending on you know if if we were to apply state sandboxes to different types of DeFi. Uh, for example, if you go on the Arizona Attorney General's website, I, there's a description of technology that could fit within um, you know, a potential applicant or a, a participant in the sandbox. And it does talk about blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies, um, but they're kind of on, um, my understanding is that they're, they're kind of more on the periphery of, of the traditional technologies that might be included. So there's some level of judgment call uh, that's involved there. And it would be interesting to hear, um, you know, I'm, I'm still thinking about this issue, but it'd be interesting to hear how a state level sandbox or a federal level sandbox, um, like I know the CFPB has, has tried to do in the past, how that would take into account um, different types of DeFi technology. So I'm also interested in, in talking more a little bit about that as the night goes on. Great, awesome. All right. If if you have any questions for uh, Paul or Grant, um, please you know post them in the chat or just uh, uh, you know chime in. Uh, Gary, anything you would like to add at this point about you know the article that you wrote on governance and the wicked uh, problem that it is, and maybe also summarize what your uh, blockchain research, um, what that paper. Uh, was addressing and some of the dimensions of that. Sure. I mean, so first of all, just let me say, I, I really agree with everything Paul and Grant said, and I think they've set it up nicely. Um, my paper on international is talking about the, the importance of some kind of international coordination for fintech, essentially, and, and certainly uh, DeFi is an example of that. It's essentially a, an international technology. It's not limited to national uh, bounds. And uh, and so our paper is basically saying, yeah, there needs to be some kind of international coordination, but you know, it shouldn't be like a treaty or these hard laws and so on that just aren't gonna work at an international level. There needs to be other types of models uh, that uh, have been uh, looked at in things like AI and biotech and some of the other technology, blockchain, I mean, uh, big, um, sorry, um, nanotechnology, some interesting international models of governance. Uh, and so that we go into that and, and I'll be happy to provide a, a copy of that to, Jay, to you, Jay. I think on the DeFi issue, I mean, as Paul set it up, I think it's a really 
interesting but sensitive time for this technology. I mean, it's really been around probably less than a year, but as you said, Jay, it's been growing you know, at an exponential pace, a tremendous amount of excitement, innovation, experimentation. These are all great things, but there can also be then overhype and, and you know, uh, exploitation as well when you have these sort of you know, mass uh, you know, excitement, just sort of like uh, Bitcoin in 2017 and ICOs. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, the question of, of governance and regulation is really on the table, as, as Paul referred to, you know, Janet Yellen in her confirmation is talking about how the vast majority of, of crypto uh, technology is, is illicit, which is just not backed by the facts. I mean, it's a very small percentage, actually, but it is there. Um, and so the concern I have is that um, uh, it doesn't really fit under existing regulatory systems. Um, you don't have anybody you can sort of enforce against. I mean, the whole point of the DeFi is that it's decentralized. There's, there's no intermediaries there to regulate. So how, how would you regulate it? How would these older systems that Paul talked about apply to this new paradigm? They don't fit well at all. Um, and so to me, you know, if there was to be a regulatory response, it would have to be sort of crafted, uh, you know, brand new and on, almost, you know, would need legislation rather than, than regulation. And so, um, you know, how, how this would move forward and whether it should move forward in terms of regulation. I think when you have such a young technology, just experimental, you know, dumping a bunch of regulation on it at this point would be really damaging and would really, uh, you know, uh, uh, impede the technology and this innovation, this experimentation. A lot of these models, business models and uh, platforms are still very experimental and still in, in development. And so to throw a bunch of regulation on them at this point, I think would be really uh, damaging. But, you know, if something bad happens, that's what's going to happen, right? I mean, if, if, if somebody does something really irresponsible and we have another major disaster like a Mount Gox or the Dow event a, a few years ago, then the regulators will act if people are losing their shirts and, and getting conned by, you know, bad actors who are in this space, very small percentage, but they're there. And they may try to exploit things. And if, if there's a big disaster that's in the news, you know, Congress takes action, these regulators will feel compelled to take action. And I think that could be really damaging. It's a real lose-lose situation for everybody. So I think, you know, the key is, you know, how can we prevent that from happening? How can we prevent a disaster, um, a, a debacle? Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of sort of tools out there, some kind of self-governance tools that, that are much softer and, and don't have the same you know, effect of deterring and impeding innovation that, that government regulation would have. And so, you know, I would, I would, you know, wonder if there are some people who could step forward and sort of lead that, you know, maybe some a self auditing, maybe some know your customer uh, without it being a regulatory mandate uh, to try to, you know, provide some assurance and so on. And so, you know, who that should be, maybe some of the companies who are creating these, you know, uh, online, uh, decentralized exchanges should get together and put together a proposal. Some other industries have done things like that. But that's where I think there'd be uh, worth a lot of thinking about. I think uh, the sandbox is a, is a really interesting idea. And as, as Grant was saying, it'd be interesting to see how the sandbox could maybe be very helpful here. I think it possibly could. So that's, a I think, should be Grant's next paper. Um, and so I think, you know, we're at this very sensitive time and, and we don't want to blow it because this is a really exciting technology are really exciting business models that are going to provide a lot of benefits and save people a lot of money by a lot cheaper way of doing different things, but uh, we don't want to blow it. And uh, this takes one set of bad actors to do that. Great. Uh, Jim Genthner, anything you would like to add? You are a um, successful uh, fintech uh, or financial construct entrepreneur and you're involved with the Arizona State University um, in hackathons and fintech and so forth. You are on mute, Jim, by the way. So I don't have anything to add what everybody has said. Hey, it's really good points. And this is a, this is an awesome panel. It's unbelievable. It's worth the price of the uh, joining the, uh, the meetup group, to be honest. But I have to wonder if there needs to be some basic guidelines um, as we move into some of these new areas. Um, and primarily I'm thinking about like open banking, some kind of, uh, you know, who owns the data? 
how do we protect consumer data and, and who owns that data? Uh, because the um, uh, DeFi is using this data uh, in their products and in their innovations. But at, the, at, at current times in the US, there's really no clear guardrails around this. And that could be used for good or bad. So well, I'm curious you, to know what the panel members think about that. I mean, <clears throat> you just touched upon a uh, fundamental point, you said in the US. And I think part of the dimension that we're dealing with is we are talking about global constructs. So, you know, honing in on any particular jurisdiction, I'm not sure how feasible that really is because pretty much anybody can participate in these, you know, the lending, the, the exchanges, you know, it's, it's completely open and completely immediately global all at once. But, you know, that's one of the great things about what we call soft law, sort of these industry guidelines or, or, or uh, self-regulation. Um, and, you know, as Jim said, uh, you know, I, I think there needs to be something like that, both for the reality of providing protection, but also the perception as well, so that people feel comfortable that there is some, some guardrails in, in place, that those are not bound by national legal jurisdictions. They can be international in scope. And so if some of the leaders in this technology were to get together and put forward a set of guidelines of, of good best practices, you know, of, of data protection, of maybe some account, uh, you know, auditing and, and other mechanisms of, of, you know, what's the right amount of ca uh, collateral to keep in, in these uh, exchanges. That would really, I think, provide an assurance to both the regulators so that they don't feel so compelled to rush in as well as the people who are using these technologies that their, their interests are being protected. So I think that's a great idea. Paul? Another element, yeah, another element that I think would be really helpful is, uh, you know, identifying a constituency. It's shocking to me to the extent that innovation really has no constituency in Washington, D.C. There are a couple trade groups, but for example, if you look at something like the unhosted wallet rule, um, that came out of out of FinCEN, um, which is a brief summary is basically like saying we want to regulate your physical wallet the way we regulate the brokerage account that you have with with uh, Schwab or Robinhood or, or whoever you have uh, with respect to, to money laundering requirements. That came out at the end of the administration. Um, almost no comment period. Very over detrimental <laughs> to innovation. Yeah, over over Christmas, over New Year's, uh, would a Republican administration ever do something like that in coal or online education or small dollar lending? No, absolutely not. Um, those are all identified. They're all constituencies there that identify these um, their business as requiring due process and notice and no regulatory overreach. Somehow those principles do not get applied to the new businesses. Um, and so I think when we think about the rule of law um, and there's a lot of conversation now about inclusion and we usually think of people uh, needing to be included, we need entrepreneurs to be included as well. The point of the rule of law is it's supposed to be neutral. It's supposed to be welcoming to everybody. In a word, it's supposed to be inclusive. It doesn't matter if you have a lobbyist, it doesn't matter in some cases if you have a lawyer, you're supposed to be able to understand it. You're supposed to have the benefit of it. Um, I think that that, unfortunately, is uh, not quite working the way it should be. So I'm hoping that there can be DeFi applications that are usable by the common person. I think that was something that was missed in the ICO phase. What we knew about Ethereum was you could use it to raise $20 million in 30 minutes. Not that it helped your neighbor who runs a restaurant raise capital in a really efficient way. Um, so hopefully people can sort of slow down. And I know we're talking about this as a global phenomenon. It would be helpful if people could just slow down and try to solve a concrete problem in their community using this technology and then be able to tell that story widely. Great. Awesome. Yeah, I, I think that's a really great point because even if it doesn't give you an exact um, guardrail, it, it starts everybody from a premise 
you know, from which they can proceed and regulators can begin to think about regulations and, and how, to, how to regulate and how to audit if auditing is, is involved. But it would start from a premise of what is it doing to, to benefit the community or society. And, and so to me, that's a really good starting point for something, you know, even though it's kind of open-ended, uh, it does set some kind of uh, framework. I, th I think um, in addition to the impact on the local communities and so forth, which is, I think, a great point and, and <clears throat> could be a strong focus, the soft law, you know, guidelines and and uh, best practices that you're talking about, Gary. You know, when you look at industry groups that have formed to provide licensing as well as education and so forth, another dimension that they provide is some sort of like um, stamp of approval for the repu reputation and the conduct of their members. And I think that's one thing that's missing out of this you know, DeFi realm is we have anybody and everybody can, can participate, you know, it's, it's in general, completely open. And um, however, you, you often don't know really who you're dealing with. There isn't any kind of um, reputational component to the ecosystem at this point. So that's an area where I think uh, there could be um, some innovative uh, constructs that are put in, in terms of reputation and so forth. So might, might there be some challenges? Um, I, I know a lot of the people who I've talked with about uh, DeFi, I feel like they're, they happen to be attracted to it in part because it's, it is uh, decentralized and it's not, you know, these formal institutions, whether it be a bank or, um, you know, uh, uh, a lending institution, there's some inherent pushback on long time institutions like that, big institutions like that. And if, if their goal is, is trying to get away from a centralized uh, singular group with lots of power, might there be pushback to them having a single kind of industry group that grants the seal of approval, um, even if it's in a less formal way, right? Even if it's just you're adhering to certain privacy guidelines um, that we as an industry deem to be uh, preferable, even if not legally required, is there, do we think some type of, um, do we think that there would be pushback by a part of the community that is otherwise going to support the, the advancement of these technologies from buying into something like that? That's a great point, Grant. And uh, yesterday I had a rather um, uh, lengthy and uh, somewhat heated conversation with another uh, person that's in the desert blockchain community. And the point this other person was making is that these DeFi constructs that are out there really aren't decentralized. A lot of them are controlled in some form or fashion, if not technically, at least um, governance wise. So, you know, I think there, there is a huge amount of concern among a lot of the, the community that's involved with this in terms of creating something that's even more centralized. It's, it's a tough uh, problem. And I think it, it, it uh, speaks to the paper that Gary wrote about, you know, the wicked, um, dimensions of emerging technology governance. And so I don't know, I don't think any of us know, and part of the, con the value of this conversation is just to kind of explore some different dimensions and sort of brainstorm a bit in terms of, you know, what is possible. But there is, there is this collision that's happening. Uh, the collision is the consumer protections, consumer safeguards that people have been used to from the legacy financial constructs are colliding with this decentralized, uh, you know, non-centralized constructs where pretty much 
anything uh, can be set up and, and anything can be launched that in my view, and I'm not an attorney, but seems to fly in the face of a lot of the um, legacy financial regulations that we have lived with and created over you know, so many years. So, um, so anyway, that's, that's so my thought. I just respond to Grant's point because I agree it's a really a great point that this, you know, we don't want to create a, a governance centralization thing. You know, it's you know, really heavily centralized. I, I used to represent the American Chemistry Council. You know, every chemical company has to join, pay fees, abide by these six different codes. If you didn't, you get kicked out, which sort of is devastating for you as a chemical company. It's a very uh, sort of heavy handed industry government regulation. It it's, does important work, uh, but, uh, you know, that doesn't seem to be a great model for here uh, for the reasons Grant said, but, you know, there's, there's some other models like the, you know, in um, the stem cell and, and uh, uh, human genome area, there's a group called the Hinkson group, which is a group of uh, a really uh, well thought of uh, about 15 experts who uh, have industry, academia, a little bit of NGO representation, who under the, the sponsorship of a donor, a philanthropic donor, uh, meet and put forward these uh, best practices for these technologies that are highly regarded. The people are really, you know, really well thought of by everybody, really. They're really seen as real leaders in that area. And they put out those guidelines and they don't have any enforcement. They don't have any, you know, uh, ongoing uh, structure or, or entity or office or anything. They just do this when a new technology is presenting challenges and they put forward these best practices for that practitioners in the field can follow and governments can look and see if you're following those and if you are they should feel quite reassured if you're not then maybe it's a it's a problem and something like that might work a lot better here a very decentralized you know a, a group of, of of credible people who have a you know, some maybe with some government experience, some industry experience, some academia, some techn technology, and put forward some best practices for this DeFi area that gives, uh, you know, uh, well-meaning entities something to follow. I mean, they're all scrambling to figure out, you know, what should we be doing, you know? Um, the government regulation clearly doesn't obviously apply to us because it's, it's, it's not set up for this type of structure. So what should we be doing? You know, what is a, a, a responsible way to go forward? And that could have so many benefits for reassuring uh, users of these technologies, reassuring the general public, reassuring government regulators. And if you do get some entities that don't seem to be following that, then maybe they should be targeted for some kind of enforcement action. But uh, this would give a little bit of a, maybe of a safe harbor even for the well-meaning entities, which is the majority of them out there to be able to go forward in a safe and responsible way. Do you think the uh, Gary that the SRO structure that the SEC has used uh, that self-regulatory organizations uh, that some of the financial uh, regulatory agencies use where they delegate some authority but then they have the authority to review rules and and so they can disagree and and uh, overturn things but they have delegated a fair amount of authority are, are you thinking of something where there's that official relationship or something more informal? i mean that's a, a good variation you know so i was thinking it wouldn't have you know like the henson group has no formal relationship to any government um, and particularly here we'd want something of, of international applicability so just as we saw with ICANN, if it's you know appointed by the u.s government that creates some doubts for some other countries um but that's a that's another interesting model to look at that you know FDA does this as well as SEC to create these entities that are sort of quasi governmental, but not completely, who can put forward some governing uh, principles. Um, that could be another model to look at. It, it deals with the issue of the funding of it at least. And because that's one of the challenges for these completely freestanding things. How do they you know, pay to, to meet and to publicize their findings if they don't have any ongoing structure? So, you know, that, I think that's a, an interesting uh, variant of that that could also be looked at, I think. Uh, and uh, again, I think Grant's got a lot of writing to do. You should write about all this. <laughs> <laughs> Willie, your, your mic is still off, so. Um, I would, uh, yeah, sorry, Willie, we can't hear you. Um, so 
I'd like to shift gears a little bit and ask, you know, put out the question, how do you think this is impacting the uh, legacy financial industry? You know, um, to me, it's kind of like if all of a sudden you've got, um, you know, a sibling and mom's in the front seat driving and, uh, you know, brother is in the, in the front seat as well with a seatbelt on and, be, and, you know, being reprimanded to behave and so forth. But then the other brother maybe or sister is in the back seat, just, you know, doing whatever they please. It, it becomes hard for, you know, mom to, to, um, control the behavior of the front seat passenger when the back seat's just doing whatever they, they please. So do you force, does anyone foresee um, that the, you know, the standard financial institutions will start to push back on their regulatory burden and say, Hey, look, these other people aren't, you know, putting out uh, prospectuses. They're not, they're not following any kind of uh, rules about, you know, disclosing information in advance, talking about um, uh, information that could impact the price of these uh, DeFi instruments. None of that. Um, does anyone foresee a time when the, you know, traditional financial institutions will say, Hey, we gotta. We can't compete with this decentralized stuff that isn't burdened by any of the regulations that we have. Any comments on that? Well, I, I think in in other areas that's probably already happened, but I think the response has not been lift these burdens off of us. Uh, you know, these institutions already have extensive compliance departments. Um, they've been hiring staff off of regulatory agencies for years. I know when uh, the large financial institutions would come in to meet with us at the CFPB, they would have their former CFPB employees who were uh, you know, friends with everybody who was still there. And I'm sure when they go in to meet with the OCC, they have their former OCC employees uh, with, a similar, with a similar experience. So I think that's a competitive advantage and probably the, the converse will occur, which is, uh, you know, how can you possibly have somebody doing something that looks like an unsecured loan? And just because you call it a flash loan, you let them charge an interest rate that would uh, violate the APR requirements of, uh, you know, most states. Um, so I, I think that that's probably the, uh, the direction that they would go. I agree with that, that they're going to go in there and, and say it's not fair that these new startups get to get a free hand and whereas they are complying and doing all these, you know, socially required and important things. And so um, they're going to be pushing the regulators to go after these guys. And uh, again, I think it's going to be hard, though, because of the different nature of the, of the companies and the, anti the, the technology, basically, that there isn't the clear, you know, intermediaries you can regulate, but, you know, if things start to go wrong, I think that will then combine with the pressure from the, the established companies who are definitely probably behind the scenes, as Paul's saying, pushing to bring these guys into the fold in terms of regulation. Um, as soon as something really major goes wrong, I think that's what's going to cause some of these agencies to move our Congress, which would be probably even worse. And so the question is, you know, how can, uh, you know, how can that be prevented, I think is the question. All right, I, I would like to go on a little bit of a tangent before we get into um, what I could, would consider to be the juicy topic of the evening. Um, What's that? Well, <laughs> <laughs> this starts, with, starts with an N, ends with a T. Ah. Um, <laughs> Um, Paul, you mentioned to me that uh, the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Board, is uh, experimenting with uh, like a green innovation sandbox. 
Um, would you mind talking a little bit about that, especially for the benefit of Jason Horton, who's who's on the session with us tonight? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, as uh, as you indicated, commodities futures uh, at CFTC, which re regulates commodities, which is directly in this space, um, because uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin, of course, are are commodities, and and so that's a relevant regulator, uh, especially for anything dealing with derivatives. Um, they've said they they reached out. Uh, they produced a, a climate sort of a climate roadmap for what the acting chair uh, was interested in. And the very last bullet said, we will consider a regulatory sandbox on climate. So it wasn't the first bullet, um, but it was in the document. And that's a very interesting point. And I don't know uh, what exactly is intended. If you look internationally, you can see the Financial Conduct Authority, I believe, has had uh, what they call text prints, which is essentially a regulator word for a hackathon. Regulators don't like to use the word hackathon because it doesn't sound like something regulators should be engaging in, but they do like the word text print. Uh, moving faster using tech has uh, positive connotations. So uh, the FCA had a text print on, uh, I think, green uh, is uh, fintech and, and, and green products, essentially. Um, so especially in the current environment, uh, where, where, uh, the administration is very focused on climate change, um, that may be a good entry point for folks, uh, if they do want to directly get in front of a regulator and talk about the benefit of their, of their particular product. Now, once you, once you have that relationship, you sort of, uh, uh, you know, you sort of have the wolf by the horns, the regulator doesn't always want to let go, um, and uh, let you fly off and, and do your thing. And, and there are some examples of that at the, uh, at the federal level. Um, but if you do want to go in and engage, uh, that may be a, a, a way to do it. Well, Jason, any questions or comments on that? Uh, no, I mean, can, I'm assuming everybody can hear me okay, right? Yep, we can hear you. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting point. I'd be interested to see um, you know, the specifics of, uh, what was mentioned, um, cause it is a, a hot topic for sure. Cool. All right. Uh, Willie, uh, Masters is having a bit of an audio issue, but he did post in the chat a question about in the sphere of governance, uh, he's bringing up the point that our, um, executive branch seems to be gathering more and more power. And, uh, you know, could there be, um, does anybody foresee something happening from the executive branch that, you know, might intervene in the DeFi and decentralized realm? Or is that too early to tell? Well, I, I think it, it very make uh, very well could. I mean, the, the unhosted wallet rule certainly has implications. Uh, I think um, there have been some CFTC and SEC enforcement actions. They've primarily been going after exchanges. Um, but again, if you look at the, uh, the FATF uh, uh, report that just came out, again, uh, Financial Agency Task Force, these, these guidelines are often incorporated into all the domestic members of this international body. Um, and they're essentially trying to regulate just about everything except a central bank digital currency, which is actually a very interesting loophole because I suspect that there is a central bank somewhere in the world that is going to say, aha, this is our opportunity. Um, we, can, uh, we can increase the uh, utilization of our currency and then uh, we'll be able to access debt more cheaply because people will want to uh, hold this this new thing that we've uh, that we've created and uh, the regulatory environment has, has sort of opened up for that so um, so so yes absolutely I, I think there will be more and again as uh, as Gary and Grant have indicated um, very likely around, sort of negative events, right? The SEC's first big statement was around uh, the Dow report 
where there was it was the Dow report, and that was about this, uh, of course, unique uh, at the time event that happened with Ethereum. Yeah, so you know, looking more broadly, Jay, I mean, there, there's a lot of debate going on in in DC where Paul's at about you know executive power under both. Uh, you know, Democratic and Republican administrations who's ever in power sort of wants to be able to do things that they want to do. And uh, our, our Congress is so slow to act on stuff. If, if the executive doesn't do it, no one will. And so you're getting a lot of activist executive uh, actions, a lot of executive orders and so on. There's a move on the Supreme Court to try to rein that in under something called the non-delegation doctrine, which has been around for 50, you know, 70 years and it's not really gone anywhere. Uh, but there's uh, been a couple of recent decisions where uh, Justice Gorsuch has, has sort of suggested it might be time. And a couple of other uh, justices are now sort of indicated some support. I don't know if there'd be a majority uh, for that. Um, but that would uh, require then that Congress be the regulator, not these expert agencies. And, and I, I think that actually might be worse, <laughs> frankly. I mean, uh, Congress doesn't have a lot of expertise. They can obviously bring stuff in, people in to help them. But um, they they uh, legislate at such a crude you know, overall level that if they were to have to do the nuts and bolts regulation, I just don't feel comfortable at all that that would be very good. And I, I think we do need in this era of, of complex real technology, uh, expert agencies to, to understand the technology. I mean, part of the problem with a lot of these new technologies like uh, FinTech and like artificial intelligence and so on is that genetics and the bio and the healthcare is that the agency staff, you know, didn't get trained on those technologies, don't, aren't experts in them. And so, you know, the agencies can't just fire all their existing staff and bring in a whole new wave because there's these new technologies. So they have to bring their, their staff up to speed too, which is a, a slow process. And, and so, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I would be probably more comfortable with these agencies and than Congress if that was the choice. But I think, you know, industry has a lot of expertise. It has a lot of people who are on the cutting edge. And if they take it responsibly, like I think is happening in AI, we have a big project looking at that in the AI context, that could be the best place to govern this technology by people who know what it is, who understand the importance of doing it in a responsible way that is good for them as well as for the public. Um, that's where the real locus of expertise is. And that's where I'd like to see the leadership on this issue. And I was really hoping to see the agencies use this work from home environment um, to augment their recruiting ability. In this, in this respect, I tried to recruit a technologist for my team uh, when we were running the Office of Innovation at the CFPB. And of course the person had to be based in DC and there are excellent folks um, of course, but we can't necessarily compete on salary. Uh, and so our pool is very limited. Uh, and if we could, pay a federal government salary to anyone in the country, um, that's actually a, an opportunity that a lot of people might seize. Um, so I'm encouraged to see a lot of agencies hiring data, data scientists and trying to build up their technological expertise. But I just know from experience, they're gonna be frustrated if, when they're trying to base all these people in uh, DC. I think the FDIC, it took them maybe over two years to find their innovation person. And it looks like they ended up with somebody excellent, but it's a, it's a very hard way to hire. Just a, a follow-up question. I realize I'm asking probably more questions than I am giving answers. So I'm sorry about that, but this, uh, this conversation has made me think a lot in good ways. So we've talked a lot about regulation and kind of the traditional aspect uh, or the traditional thought of regulation, either through you know, the legislature or through administrative agencies. And that definitely is, you know, the, the primary form of regulating. But if we're talking about maybe that that type of regulation not getting done anytime in in uh, the near term, and if courts are going to have to deal with issues related to these technologies more and more, um, I imagine the knowledge gap is even going to be worse for the judges who are having to deal with attempting to address these technologies, especially without any framework to guide them. Um, does anyone know, I, I do not know off the top of my head of any efforts to educate um, judges, especially at the federal level. And I would think that the federal circuit specifically about these issues, um, or if there's been any you know, thought given uh, towards, towards education in the future on these issues. 
Well, before COVID, I was giving about 30 lectures a year to judicial conferences. I did a, one to all the federal circuit judges who brought in a lot of uh, other district court judges from around the country for that session on how to govern emerging technologies like AI and blockchain uh, and, and FinTech. Um, and then speak at state uh, judicial conferences, right? You only get an hour or two and it's part of a two or three day conference and that's their technology uh, spiel. But um, they are very interested in this because they, they basically see what you're saying, Grant, is that they're all gonna be on the front lines. If there isn't rules out there, if there isn't regulations, um, this technology is going to go forward because there is so much benefits and drive behind it. Uh, and there will be problems emerge. And if there's not regulators to enforce rules, then it's going to come straight to the courts. And they're seeing that in a lot of different technologies already. And these poor judges who usually don't have any scientific technical background, don't have uh, the capability to bring higher scientific experts like the agencies at least can try to, or Congress can bring in, um, and, uh, you know, they're just sort of stuck out there on their own having to deal with this. So I, I think it's a huge issue and a huge problem. Um, I do think they're interested in learning. And, uh, and uh, I've spoken probably to about 70% of the nation's judges in the last three years because I go to these huge conferences of judges. I just came from one in Florida a couple of weeks ago, uh, my first trip in a year. Uh, but, um, you know, I'm just one person. And there's some other people doing this stuff as well. But it, it's still not enough, I don't think. Well, speaking of uh, scratch your head technology, uh, any comments from anyone about non-fungible tokens, NFTs, because, you know, mostly what we've been talking about tonight are cryptocurrencies and so forth, which are fungible tokens. And now we've got these uh, non-fungible tokens that's just opened up a whole new uh, realm. I was at dinner um, Saturday night and the table next to me, they were talking about NFTs. So that was like, wow, this thing is really, really exploded. We, we had a talk in our center today about it uh, at our uh, community board meeting. We had a speaker on, on NFTs. Blows me away. Uh, you know, I think that your blockchain should create some. I mean, <laughs> cash in on the on the thing. We're talking about doing it at the law school. Create some NFTs of each little block of space. In the, that our buildings on and, and and buying and owning that that you could buy it now and create an nft over that so it's, it's just a mind-blowing thing and i guess there's a lot of people with some extra money around is, is all i can say <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm about to launch my video clip of my uh half court jump shot uh <laughs> stuff in into the net uh gary so you can you can look right. for that soon i'll be bidding on I, it I <laughs> it'll it'll I it'll bring at least five dollars <laughs> I thought Grant might just start burning those pictures on his uh, on his wall behind him and converting them into <laughs> NFTs while we speak. <laughs> um, well, I, I'm, I'm going to leave that to your session next month on this. Yeah, trip. next month we will have a session on NFTs and uh, property uh, dynamic property rights and so forth. I'm going to have to study up on it because it's it's kind of a new realm for me as well. And that I'd be, be I'd be happy to uh, Jay I'd be happy to speak a little bit on that. Um, yeah, Nori awesome. Nori Nori uses um, NFTs. In fact, it's kind of wild to see NFTs kind of reemerge because um, I mean we started building on top of NFTs like two two and a half years ago when the kind of standard launched um, and they they got pretty popular with uh, like Crypto Kitties. Mm -hmm. like, Crypto Kitties yeah. are NFTs, right? It's just the reemergence of that same thing. Um, right. But. Uh, yeah, with all the digital artworks and like the sort of public reception of the, uh, you know, the trading of art and music and things like that, it's a bit of a different game now that there's so much more money involved with it than there was before. Yeah, well, that's great, Jason. I, I will uh, highlight you as the speaker <laughs> for next uh, session. And if you have any other suggestions or if anybody has any other suggestions for additional expertise in the NFT area, please let me know. But I think that that will be awesome and then the following month in may i am tentatively planning to have a session on uh, central bank digital currencies um, i'm going to invite some folks from the federal reserve uh, i don't know if they'll accept this but but i just would kind of like to since it's been mentioned this evening um, that is on on the radar so Anyway, uh, we are at the end of our time. Thank you, 
all of you so much for participating. I think it's been a great conversation. And I think that, you know, I, I acknowledge this panel because I really get the intent. Your intent is to craft something that fosters innovation, but also provides consumer safeguards and something that's workable so that all this amazing technology can really go mainstream. So I acknowledge all of you for that. So um, tune in again next uh, fourth Wednesday of the month, which I believe is April 28th. And we'll be talking about NFTs and dynamic uh, property rights and use cases. So thank you very much and have a good evening. Thanks, Jay. Yep, thank, thank you, Jay. Jay. Thanks, everybody. It was yeah. a great panel.